Now, and our next guest is a nationally syndicated columnist, a freelance investigative journalist, a comedian, and an on-air commentator, too, probably an off-air commentator as well. Tina Dupuis is the former managing editor of the blog Crooks and Liars, which is where I first met her, and her new podcast, Cultish, just launched. She came on the show a few months ago to tell us how the Kickstarter was going, and now here we are. She joins us once again. Tina, thanks for coming on the program. Richard, it's always good to see you. Yeah, same here. Although I actually won't see you until the video is edited together <laughs> later, but You're never. You're supposed to bluff that out. You're supposed to oh, lie. Don't darn you know? it. Great to see you. You're looking to... great today. Um, yeah. that, there, am I getting it? Oh, haircut. Uh, right, right, I love the hair. Um, now listen, Cultish, which uh, you, we had you on to talk about a little while ago, is now on the air and live. How's it going? Uh, well, within the first 48 hours of launching, we ended up in the top 200 uh, podcasts on iTunes. Um, it has, we've been getting stellar reviews. Uh, people have been comparing it to to cereal, uh, I people have been tweeting, and there I've been dealing so much with the people who love the show that it's actually getting hard for me to work on the show. So well, I might need an intern just to do just to deal with all of the um, the fans, or an intern to do the show while you deal with the fans. That's the other Fair. boss. Think about it. Um, so okay, the show the show's doing well. I'm thrilled to hear it. Uh, so you've had what uh, two bro two broadcast podcasts by now or uh, more? Yeah, no, we have we have two episodes. It's a serial, so uh, that we have um, in each episode we have a standalone vignette about fanaticism and its fallout, and then we have the next installation of the serial that we're taking an ins uh, the story that we're taking an entire season to tell. Uh, so we have so far two episodes out, and if you know you're listening to this, you have to listen to them in order, <laughs> um, or it, you know, it kind of defeats the, the purpose. But yeah, we're we're now just editing uh, episode three. We hope will be out uh, next week. So tell us about both. Tell us about the independence, the individual stories you've uh, told, and tell us about the continuing, uh, the the continuing the serial. Yeah. So episode one, we have a defector from the Westboro Baptist Church, one of Fred Phelps's sons, uh, Nate Phelps, and he talks about kind of his journey through. Uh, leave, you know, growing up in that kind of super fringe uh, cult, and how uh, how it it was for him to how it is for him to now live in this world um, as someone who's now an LGBT advocate um, and an atheist, and basically the exact opposite of how he grew up. Um, the the serial this season, and we have a really cool one for next season too. This is we have some really exciting stuff coming up. Uh, this season, it's about my uncle, who was one of the top leaders in the Children of God, and it is uh, is it's his story. He quite famously, infamously, went on Larry King Live in 1993 and uh, admitted to having sex with a ten year old, and um, that it, that was always something that I um, was mortified by, embarrassed of, and um, and I have in the last 20 years have. Uh, come to see that differently and so I'm I'm investigating my uncle finding out who he is what he what he was and uh, what that meant to the people in that group you know it, it it's really uh, it's such an interesting uh, topic in in so many ways one just because it's so out there you know it's so extreme it's such a riveting story but too because I think everybody in their own lives has some aspect of their family or their background or I think many people do, I should say, where there's kind of shame associated with it, and there shouldn't be, because what you're born into is nothing you should be ashamed of, but somehow we internalize it, don't we? And we kind of carry it around until we figure out how to tell that story the right way. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm trying to say? I mean, you, have, you get adulation for who your parents are, uh, Donald Trump's son, for example. Uh, you get people, uh, or even uh, Meghan McCain, would be another one where it's like you know her her one quantified is that she is someone's daughter um, and who her parents are it gives her credibility uh, but when you come from uh, let's call it the fringe where I come from uh, it, it 
immediately people are like, oh, it doesn't matter where you where you come from. Well, it kind of does. Um, at least for for me, it's taking this kind of sensitivity that I have um, growing up on in the fringe around people who are fanatics um, and into all the let's call it weird stuff, where I I can um, I can recognize another people. Well, and I can also um, tell that story from a different perspective. Uh, in the introduction, I try to make this clear that you know most of the time when we talk about cults in the media, it's this kind of drive-by and gawk, and every, everyone's like, "Wow, look at the weirdos," and then we move on. But or we think that everybody who, who's in a cult commits mass suicide, and there's there's a lot. There are uh, plenty of victims of these of these movements uh, of these you know, communities. They also use that euphemism sometimes. Uh, you know where they are still among us, and it's very lonely and it's very isolating, and those stories just aren't out there. Uh, so we, the response, just having been out there and uh, talk in, in announcing that I I'm doing this kind of work and, uh, and interested in these kind of stories, I, I get you know, I mean I'm getting half a dozen emails a day from people who want to talk about their all the experiences and it, it, some of them are funny and a lot of them are, are tragic and sad yeah you know I mean there was a, a, a psychiatrist named Judith Herman wrote a book called trauma and recovery where she said you know mm -hmm. the way that we heal is by helping others heal and the way we help others heal is by telling our story Tina Dupuis is the host of the podcast cultish and I guess the other side of this that intrigues me Tina is is the uh, existence of um, the charismatic personality that personality that's so powerful that he or she is able to induce people to do things that I would guess many of them would normally have said before they meet the charismatic person they would never do in a million years and then they find themselves doing some of these extreme things that Come out that you've described in your own background, and uh, that have other people have experienced with other groups, and so on. So, uh, uh, not too many of us actually even know someone like that, and you were close to someone like that. Has that changed your view of the world? Do you think? Um, being near a charismatic leader. Yes. No, I'm sure. I mean, but everything, arguably, everything that one experiences changes. Yeah, sure, but I, I, you know, so, and maybe said it's, about trauma. Yeah. I think that what I'm sorry we're getting a little drop off here and there I, I, I think everything that you experience changes you sometimes it's not in a way it's not a fair question because it's not always easy to tell but does it for example does it make you look at public personalities differently a Donald Trump or someone else who's in the public yeah. eye well yes and I and I also think that I mean I think that it's really healthy as a journalist to hold these charismatic leaders and we'll, in this instance we'll call them politicians with a, a, with a degree of contempt. Um, I think that that most people who cover entertainment should could possibly have uh, that in, in their in their quiver. Um, I, I think that that a, a healthy amount of skepticism that we are all uh, that some people are just better at manipulating other people than others. Uh, I think is is a fantastic way of of um, investi in, in investigative journalism, um, a, a fantastic background. Um, but I, I wanted to go back to the PTSD that you mentioned because I think that we're going to do everybody I've interviewed thus far has had some kind of experience with PTSD, and um, and I know that you know we I've talked about this publicly. I mean, what I thought when um, I was um, put into AA when I was 13 and I thought that um, uh, what I was told at the time were symptoms of being a newcomer. I mean, I had drank like maybe a half a dozen times in my life, if that, and ended up in AA, but uh, it wasn't until uh, 20 years later did I realize that a lot of those symptoms were actually symptoms of PTSD. And uh, there's a fantastic book called Evil Hours. And what he talks about, it's a biography of PTSD, and what he talks about is before movies, before uh, we had uh, the uh, nomenclature of, of, of films, we didn't use the term flashbacks when it came to PTSD. Shell-shocked, uh, that came uh, with the advent of movies. Before that, people described the, their PTSD symptoms as being hauntings. As and being so, what? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear hauntings. that. Hauntings. 
hauntings. Uh, yeah. Hauntings, like they were seeing ghosts. Mm -hmm. So the Civil War soldiers that came back from the war and couldn't quite shake it off, they would describe it as having seen ghosts being haunted by these, by uh, what had happened to them. And to me, that is such a more apt uh, description of what it's like to suffer from PTSD than uh, flashbacks, which kind of denotes that you're that you know things are more clear and not quite as terrifying and messy as uh, as as suffering from these traumas are. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, uh, without going too much into my own background right now, just because there's no time, we're talking about cultish and, and your program. We're talking about there. me, but and, and you. Uh, so I don't want to change the subject too much, but I would also say that you know I think. Um, PTSD or post-traumatic response can also be felt. Not, a flashback is a visual image. To me, it can, it's a body mm -hmm. thing sometimes, that it can be just a reaction you, I get in my body if somebody physically comes too close and I'm not expecting it, for example. So I, I don't know about you, but for me, all, all the visual imagery isn't quite right. It's more a matter of, of a gut feeling and of learning to say, this is not happening in the real world around me. This is something that reminds me of something in the past and it's causing an almost visceral response. Does that make sense to you? No, it does, absolutely. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Also smells, there, there are triggers um, that everyone has and it's completely you know, subjective. Yeah, so let, let's go back to cultish for a second, Tina. Yes. Um, so how many episodes are you, you gonna be doing in this first season? Well, you know, we this is um, this is the riveting part of let's call it documentary filmmaking for the radio. Um, we have outlines of about ten episodes, but then we're kind of going with what the um, where the evidence takes us. Mm -hmm. And so I we kind of think that we know what how it's going to end, but then we are getting contacted by other people who have more information, who have a different point of view. Um, we have, so to answer your question, we know it's gonna end. We don't know exactly how many. So where can people go to uh, find out more about it? Well, you can go to iTunes and just and search for Cultish. We're up there. Uh, and also cultish.org.